Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 128. Are you okay? PhD edition. I'm excited. As you can see, I have two incredible women that are with me today. How exciting is this? So we've got Hannah Scott and we've got Emily Crawley. Yay! Um, and they're doing something remarkable. They are our postgraduate representatives. We have the best postgraduate representatives ever. But they're doing something remarkable and this initiative has come from them. They are very interested in the issue of mental health for our research higher degree students. And of course we've got Are You OK Day coming up shortly. So we thought this was timely and a great opportunity in a vlog to have these two extraordinary women help me, help you, but also more directly talk about issues that we should talk about a lot more than we actually do. And look, this is becoming a key issue, I would argue, in doctoral education. And let's talk about these two great women. So Hannah is a remarkable PhD student in psychology, first class honours from her Bachelor of Psychology in 2016. Big brain. Big brain. <laughs> and Emily is a PhD student in chemistry, again, first class honours from her Bachelor of Science. So this is the best and the greatest of what we do at Flinders University, and we're very lucky to have you both. And together, they wanted me to talk through some of the challenges that are occurring in the space now that look, to be frank with you, even three years ago, we weren't talking about, and you know, it's time to do that. So we'll start with the obvious question, starting with gorgeous Hannah, and I'll ask the dreadful question, tell us about your PhD. <laughs> Don't get that question enough. Um, <laughs> so my PhD, I'm developing this new sleep wearable device called FIM, um, and so I'm just testing how accurate it is for measuring sleep and also looking at what it could be used for, so as a treatment for insomnia um, and also to help people achieve a power nap. Can I say this, this, this could change my life, this could <laughs> change my life, and for a lot of PhD students and academics more generally, sleep is something we really care about. So this is fantastic and of course my darling one, tell us about your thesis. Oh yes, um, so my project is aiming to use the Vortex Clitic device which has been used for some other protein work um, but I'm aiming to focus on the production of insulin, so used for diabetic um, therapies and the idea is that we can make it more efficiently in a more green way and in a quicker way so that it can be cheaper. So again, that would be transformative not only of what's happening in Australia, but imagine around the world exactly. in terms of cost, exactly. as that's becoming a much more serious issue with yep. the proliferation of, of yep. type 2 in particular. Yep. And in third world countries where it is growing so much faster and they're not able to afford in the same way that we can in first world countries. This is remarkable. So as you can see, fantastic scholars, the future of Australian universities is sitting with me today, and we're very lucky to have these two. But why I'm so proud of you both, and I adore you both, and I respect you as, as scholars, but why I'm so proud of you both is you both came to us and said you wanted to do something in relation to the Are You OK Day for PhD students. I think it's Thursday, September 13 this year, and we are doing a thing, which we'll talk about later. But why is this something that triggered your attention? Why is this a thing for you? Em, do you want to start, mate? Yeah, um, so I think we all see the students around us that are struggling with various mental health issues that come through not only just from the stress of PhD, but from the stress of life outside of that. And Are You OK Day is really about having a conversation. It's not about changing the world, it's just about being there for your friends and asking, are you OK? Brilliant. Madela? Yeah, I think it's a conversation that um, not many people have, especially um, PhD students. I think we feel a bit of a pressure to just kind of soldier on. Um, and so wow. I think um, bringing this into the spotlight will help encourage people to be a bit more open, um, to come forward and chat about um, the issues they're having, or to chat to other students who might be having issues um, and start to create a bit of a dialogue there, because I think it's really lacking at the moment. As we talked about when we were prepping this vlog today, I'm going to learn a great deal from these two. That notion of a PhD student feeling that they should soldier on, yeah. I hadn't thought about. And that is a very unhealthy, frightening space for me as a dean because it means you just keep going and then it becomes almost untenable for you to go beyond that. That's making a lot of sense to me. 
my argument, guys, is about two years ago was that famous study, I think, in, in Belgium, uh, in Flanders, where there were 3,000... 659 students in that study from the social sciences and the sciences, which is why it's really appropriate you're both here. And that <coughs> famous study showed that one third of PhD students are suffering from anxiety and depression, one third. So why does the doctoral space, do you think, summon these types of issues? What's going on here? Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting as well because you think about what a PhD is and it's about you know self-growth there's a level of autonomy there um, it's about um, mastery as well and so they're all things that are conducive to a good like positive well-being achievement <laughs> mental you know you, you, you're trying new things experimenting learning getting exactly. positive feedback exactly so the fact that you know it is the prevalence rates are so high in PhD students is a weird one. I think it kind of just shows that something's going wrong yes. in the PhD experience that potentially, you know, the way that we think a PhD should be, that's not how it's actually happening now. So maybe people don't have the level of autonomy that they should have or, you know, maybe they're just not um, getting the most from the experience that they should be getting. Well, see, that's powerful. So you're arguing how we think it's going mm -hmm. and how it's actually going. There's a big gap there. Definitely. And in that gap, we're finding these issues emerging. Is that, is that what you think, too? I would agree, yeah. I think it also comes down to the fact that students that undertake a PhD are generally that high level, very intelligent, very at risk of developing these issues just from the get-go, just because of the type of people that go for a PhD. Wow, so so the demanding of themselves because they're yeah. high achievers mm. and brilliant, and, and also, would you say, used to being successful? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And the PhD space can also be a space where you get some pretty tough feedback mm -hmm. too, maybe that's part of it as well. Mm -hmm. So supervisors, you're dealing with the supervisors all the time, and every day we have a bad day and we might be mm -hmm. a bit flippant or mm -hmm. something comes out the wrong way. Mm -hmm. and. It can be treated really seriously. That's it. Yeah. So, ooh. Yeah. Well, not to mention like mm. the own pressures we put on ourselves. <laughs> you know, and you only get one PhD, so mm. we try our best, um, and sometimes we just put a bit too much pressure on ourselves. I think. Look, I think so too. And part of what we're going to be talking about today, because these two will be remarkable supervisors in and of themselves, um, they're clearly better deans than I am. Can I say the meetings we have? They give me a lot of really, really good advice. So they've got a great career in front of them, but. I'll be interested if you end up supervising differently from how you were supervised, and, and you might because I think you're much more aware of these issues than I certainly ever was. And the interesting thing is from that study in Belgium, they confirmed, and this was weird to me, they confirmed that two variables actually enable the students to remain healthy and well, so stop them going into anxiety and depression. And those two variables are, and they use this amazing phrase we've talked about, an inspirational supervisor, an inspirational supervisor uh, is important, but also a sense of the possible future beyond the PhD. So if a student has a sense of that possible future and an inspirational supervisor, then they're more likely to be okay. Are you convinced by that argument? I'll ask the psychologist first. Are you convinced by that argument? <laughs> it's an interesting one. When I first heard inspirational supervisor, I kind of thought, what does that mean? Mm. I guess um, if you pull it back a little bit, it might mean more just positive reassurance, mm. guidance, um, just I suppose like a positive supportive figure mm. in the student's life to help them get through. It's potentially what they mean by that. And I think you know, yeah, that kind of makes sense that students who have that supportive <laughs> person um, will do well. Um, that yeah. you've convinced me. <laughs> I, I didn't understand it and now I do. Thank you, psychologist to the stars. Yeah. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> where, where were you on this? Because also the future trajectory for scientists mm. in, a, in a, you know, the, the postdoc or as nature refers to it, the permadoc, yeah. um, you know, the future is a challenging space. Are you convinced by those to two variables? I would definitely agree with the future. Yeah. idea because um, we know that at the moment so the numbers are there are 50,000 academic positions in Australia and every year 10,000 PhDs graduate yes there's not enough jobs for us out there so we kind of hear about these academic jobs but if we're not going to be successful in that we don't really know what else there is that we can be going for and that can be a very big stressor in terms of I'm doing all this work for this PhD but is it going to get me somewhere in the future? Yeah and as we've talked about a lot in these vlogs too we've really only got about 40% 
of our PhD students that remain in universities. Mm -hmm. So 60% don't, mm. and that's of course, you've worked me out, that's why we did the, the Vitae Professional Development Program, so that these guys actually have the skills, and of course, they, they know where their future could be. Here are the options that are available, here's the skill sets, don't panic, you'll be absolutely great, mm. but the future may not look like you think it did or was going to when you started this when you were 21, 22, 23. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, let's, let's get to the political bit of this story, shall we, you two? Universities have neglected this issue. Before I was dean, so that's about two and a half years ago, I didn't even know this was a thing. And I research in doctoral studies, right? So why have universities neglected this issue? A big question. It is. <laughs> um, I guess it comes back to the whole there's been silence on this issue. There's not a lot of openness. Mm -hmm. um, so I think awareness is pretty low, though it is getting better when you see studies like the Flanders study come out. I think people are starting to get on their radar a bit more. Yeah. Um, I think as well, it's the whole you know soldiering on kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's just an accepted part of a PhD that at some point you struggle. Um, that trial by fire narrative I hear from people yeah. about my age, you know, that mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to go through this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Um, it's shocking actually, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the PhD at all. I don't think it should be an accepted part of it. Um, I think people should call it as it is um, and that it is an issue and that people should be dealing with it. Look, absolutely, and I think that trial by fire issue is a concern. Also, I've always been frightened, and I'll be really honest with you both and our wonderful viewers, is I get frightened that academic life is so ruthless and competitive and aggressive, and it's not meant to be this way. Mm. And, and there is that notion that we eat our own young, mm. that like, oh, we've got, we've got these bright young people coming after us, and you know, we suffered, so they've got to suffer like we suffered, and we didn't suffer, it was a different economy, sort yourself out, but am, am I convincing yeah. you on this? Yeah, and I think that's the culture that we come into, and we sort of get that from our supervisors and from academics that are out there, yeah. and yeah, you don't feel like as the student, as the sort of subordinate, that you can push back and do too much about that. Yeah. I also wonder, we're going to talk about gender in a second, I wonder how that operates, particularly if you're a younger PhD mm. student. I mean, I did my research masters when I was 21, and I'd finished my PhD by, I was, by the time I was 24. Mm. And you're, you're both you know, very young and fabulous as well. I just wonder if, if youth impacts on this as well. Mm. Mm. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of the, the older guys and gals, the guys and gals in the 60s and 70s and indeed 80s, and, and they tell me pretty clearly about what I'm doing wrong mm. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Hey Bruce, hey Vicky, um, let alone Andrew. Um, but they they tell me what's going on. I wonder if we're, we're the younger PhD student, we put up with more mischief. Mm. It's also we have less experience with dealing with a supervisor or a manager, just in terms of in the workplace or anything like that. We're not as used to how that relationship should be, that it should be a bit of give and take, and that you know there's a lot more to it than just I do what they tell me to do. Mm, exactly. And also a lot more than give and take, you're our future. Mm. The bit of the story I'm not quite grasping is that we're training you so you can replace us. That, that's the point of this. So if, if we're damaging people that are going to replace us, that just doesn't seem right to me. So, so therefore, my next question is the one I've always wanted to ask you both, which is, you know, I've, I've been in university since I was 17 and I stayed. Uh, but academia is a very odd industry. This is universities are a weird workplace. Strange stuff happens here. So, as people who are coming into this business, what are you seeing in our workplace that's unhelpful, unhealthy, or a bit weird? Do you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, so I do think the relationship between PhD students and their supervisors, but just also anyone working in the university and their supervisors and the university organisation as a whole is very different to my working experience that I've had previously. So any other managers I've had, I've always felt were very much aware of what was going on with me and caring about my professional development and my health and how they could help me to do my job better. Whereas it doesn't always feel like that in the university situation. Yeah. There's a ruthlessness here, isn't yes. there? 
there is a ruthlessness here, and, and that is the bit that upsets me the most, I think. It's funny you, you say that. Where, where are you on this? Do you, do you agree, or is it, do you find it quite civilised? Uh, no, I completely agree. <laughs> uh, I think as well, one of the warring trends that I've seen is um, this kind of normalisation of unhealthy um, work yeah. practices, yeah. Um, yeah. and people it's become almost like, you see people being idealised for taking too much on, <laughs> yeah. and you're kind of expected to have a really high workload, um, which obviously places a lot of strain on the person, and I find that completely odd you know when you hear about you know academics where they work on weekends and you know very late at night and they're kind of almost celebrated for that's that right. like that's yeah. normal not only normal but something you should aspire to mm. and I think that's incredibly damaging for mm. PhD students because they see this and they think oh well that's what I need to do as well I need to work myself to the bone basically and see I find this horrifying and can I say the reason I'm sort of laughing and sort of a bit horrified is of course I have very very unnatural sleeping habits you know and I, I do get up at two in the morning and I have said that but it's amazing how many students around the world have emailed me and said oh Tara can you give us your morning routine mm -hmm. and I was like no I can't this is nothing to emulate this is this is this is what I've done. It hasn't been right. It's got me to where I am. But this is not right. It's not good. It's not proper. And we have to make sure the next generation do not have to do this because these hundred plus hour weeks, which we do do, th this is, this is madness. This is madness. And I've worked in a lot of departments where people have topped themselves. And also the other thing we rarely talk about, you know, the the divorce rate. The relationship breakdowns that happen in university environments. You know, these are the, the secrets we need to mm -hmm. share with our PhD students, so they're seeing a fully fleshed life. Mm -hmm. You know, not the positives. Oh, we're getting on. We've got plenty of money. Oh, isn't this exciting? I'm getting a prize. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a cost here, yeah. and it's a serious cost, and you have the right to determine whether or not you want to pay that cost. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's a. You touched on it being right and wrong. I think there's a different right for everyone Spot as well. On. Mm -hmm. So um, what a workload that someone else can deal with may be entirely different to what you can. Um, and that's okay. That doesn't mean you're weak or anything like that. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. Um, it just means you're different. <laughs> and that's so powerful that the whole role model thing, you know, I always have problems with the words like mentoring and role modeling because it's suggesting there is a role model. And actually, the one thing I've learned about academic life is, you know, water finds its own level. Exactly. And someone might have a fantastic idea that emerges in two minutes. It might take someone else 200 hours. Don't judge it. Water finds its own level. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are no role models. There are only options. Let's talk gender. This one surprised me. This one surprised these two. Now, I read a, a piece by Elizabeth Payne. What a great name. Elizabeth Payne, uh, in the March uh, 6, 2018 edition of Science magazine. And Elizabeth reported that one third of male respondents d explained that they had depression or anxiety. So one third male, 40%, so a bit higher, 40% females reported depression and anxiety. But intriguingly, more than half of the transgender and gender non-conforming students reported depression and anxiety. So we've got about so a third of blokes, so 33% bloke, 40% women, way over 50% for our transgender community. I didn't really think gender for this, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Explain it to me. What's what's happening? So I think um, part of it would be underreporting um, from men. We know that you know in psychological research, um, men are less likely to report mental health issues. Yeah. So that is definitely at play there. Um, I think in terms of you know transgender people, I think it comes back to representation. I mean, we were talking before about um, role models. I think not having role models there or visible. Um, in academia yeah. definitely plays a role. It makes it feel like they don't belong, even though they definitely do. Mm. Um, and yeah, that can definitely... Oh, right. So one of the causes of this stuff was that pathway mm -hmm. thing post mm -hmm. the PhD. So, and it could also argue it's harder for women because there are fewer women exactly. in the senior roles in universities. So for women and the transgender community in particular, that trajectory post the PhD they're not seeing mm -hmm. a vision or a version of themselves? Yes, exactly. I think we've just worked some stuff out there. So that's brilliant. Mm. Gender. 
Yeah. Gender and science. Gender. Exactly. Gender. Yeah. yeah. So the huge issue in science is that women have career breaks to have children or various other reasons and then it can be very challenging to get back into the career. Back to the lab. And so, yeah, you see that like they've got this scissor graph where at the start there are more PhDs that are female than male and then as it goes along and you get to a certain level, I think it's level B, it is. then it splits the other way it and does. you have so many more male professors than female professors. Stunningly so we so. have no idea, like we don't have that model for future planning that, you know, these women can make it to the top yeah. and therefore we can too. Yeah. And look, the, the old scary feminist in me um, has that line about, you know, when I, when I was the age of you two, it was like, oh, women can have it all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would love the idea that they can, but you know what, as the old nana here, I'm not sure women can. I'm really not. And w- we need to be changing the systems and the structures around women rather than thinking that women are going to change. Yes. That if, if, if women quite rightly want to have it all, which means have what men have, um, then it's not about an individual woman making choices. It's about the social structure configuring that flexibility and that redundancy within it mm-hmm. so that women have those choices and those options. Mm. Well, I think we've just sorted that statistic out. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, I don't understand that. You've just explained it to me, Britain. Um, right, let's, let's get into what we're going to do. What 2018 and 2019, while well, I've got these two wonderful women, what we're going to do. Now, the mental health issue is a major concern for the Office of Graduate Research. I picked up about six months in to this job, something odd was happening. And we have this fantastic partnership with our colleagues in health and counselling. They've been great all the way through. And it has been a real partnership too because specialist counselling for our PhD students has emerged. So this isn't our PhD students going into generic counselling environments. This is specialist counsellors understanding the doctoral experience and working through. So that's been fantastic. But what else can we do, guys? What you know, that, That's been great and it's helped a lot of people, but the problem is bigger than that. What else can we do? I think we need to start tearing down these stigmas, yeah. these things that are yeah. barriers in the way of people getting help. Mm. Um, we know one of the big ones is you know, fear of being discriminated against if they do come forward. Um, and that's a legitimate fear, I think. Yeah. That, yeah. That's not, you know, ambiguity. ambiguity. That's yeah. a legitimate fear. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's other issues as well, like social isolation is huge for PhD students. Um, we need to start tackling these things if we're going to see a difference here. So, managing that social isolation, but speaking the words, saying the words, talking about academic life mm. in its texture and its depth and its complexity, being honest mm. about this very odd workplace. Mm. Yeah. I think it's really about being proactive rather than reactive. We have to realise that this is a problem and it probably will always be a problem, but how can we be proactive about bringing the conversations up and bringing these ideas around and helping people to understand what's going on rather than when you get to the point of crisis and there's just you feel like there's nothing else you can do and then it's very reactive and you've got to sort of manage the situation and find a way to finish the PhD and get through. Gee, you're, you're wise. So I think I've worked out what I've done wrong and I say why I've done it. So I've been reactive. So here is a problem, here is a pressure point. Let's try and manage, manage this to care for the student and care for the thesis and get them through. But as you said, that's very reactive and it's not addressing the wider cultural issues. You know, something is going wrong in the doctoral space, the wider doctoral space, and we're not addressing that. We're, again, handling an individual student when this is much bigger than this. And so being proactive, and I think we've talked about that, so avoiding the social isolation, talking about it, and of course the proactive thing these two have come up with is we're doing a, a PhD research master's event for Are You OK Day this year. So what are you planning and, and what do you hope to achieve through it? We'll support you in any way we can. What's going to happen? Uh, so we're hoping to have a social event um, in recognition of Are You OK Day. There will be nipples, <laughs> there will be platters. There will be platters, there'll be yes. balloons. <laughs> there will be balloons um, and conversation as well. Um, we're just trying to uh, establish those connections um, between students because, you know, we're, we're all in this boat together. A lot of the issues that we face um, are common, even if our disciplines and our tenatures aren't common. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah and we know we are like one of our greatest resources um so let's make use of that mm. phenomenal yeah um i just want to read a quote from the founder of are you okay day so he says that getting connected and staying connected is the best thing that any of us can do both for ourselves and anybody else who might be at risk so that's really what we want are you okay to be are you okay day to be about so getting connected. Getting connection. I'll, I'll raise the other issue that you can help me with too. The diversity of PhD students now. I've always argued, people go, oh look, well what's, what's changed? Actually a lot has changed. We have a greater diversity of PhD students right now than at any point in the history of higher education. You know, the widening participation agenda worked. And as you know, the average age of PhD students starting at Flinders is 36. So the challenge is how we're proactive while respecting that diversity too. Yeah. Yeah. We all, you know, we all have lives, most of us have lives before we enter the PhD. <laughs> Had a little bit of a life this before I got, <laughs> tiny little one before I got in. Um, and yeah, and there's value in that. Um, and I think there's value in sharing experiences. Um, yeah, and it's, we can support each other even if our lives are very different. I think that's true. And also we are a community in a, in a time of really weird politics, and that's just Australia. Um, <laughs> weird politics, Trump, Brexit, cruel, brittle, nasty time. Mm. I always wanted, when I was your age, I always wanted a university to represent the best of what humanity could be. Mm. So the best of what a workplace could be, kindness, decency, compassion, that's what I wanted. And you know, maybe it's the time for all of us to return to that idea mm. and make universities and make doctoral education the best of what humanity could be rather than the worst. Yeah. And you guys are doing this for us, so we are so <laughs> thrilled. Hannah and Emily, how lucky are we to have you two astounding women? Um, you make me proud, incredibly proud to be a woman. You make me incredibly proud to be an Australian and incredibly proud to work at Flinders University. So whenever I think, why am I doing this? I just think of these two and you just go, that'll get you up in the morning every time. Two remarkable women. So on behalf of the, the three of us, um, we wish you love, light and peace. We're out. <laughs>